Good morning, dear friends. It's good that we are able to gather again on this day, the uh, 4th of October, 2020. Um, I am Pastor James Capers, and here at Salem Shalom Lutheran Church in Indianapolis, uh, Indiana. Um, for those of you who have been here before, you know that this is a word and sacred ministry, which means we're going to experience the word um, as it is uh, read, as it is spoken, and also uh, under the forms of bread and wine. And if you are going to commune with us, we would invite you to um, make sure that you have a communion packet. Those of you who are here in the parking lot, the packet is um, available as you drive into the parking lot. And for those of you who are at home, um, please um, go and get some bread and also some uh, wine or grape juice and be prepared to, uh, so that we could commune one with another. We're going to begin our service with the brief order for confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Let us pray. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and then grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Dear friends, perhaps as you think this past week, there might be some things for which uh, you are sorry you either did or you left uh, undone or some things that you've thought even. And, uh, and so we're going to have an opportunity to have a moment of silence so that we can think of those things so that when we uh, use the words of confession, we can have those things in mind. So let's just have a moment of, of silence. So let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. Please repeat after me. Lord have, mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Let us pray. Beloved God, from you come all things that are good. Lead us by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to know those things that are right, and by your merciful guidance, help us to do them through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 3, starting in the middle of verse 4. Paul writes, if anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, 
I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and, and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his suffering by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it known because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it of my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the price of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. This ends the reading. Hallelujah. Jesus says, I choose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit that will last. Hallelujah. The Holy Gospel for this Sunday is written in Matthew chapter 21, beginning at verse 33. And Jesus says, Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. And then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants into the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants they beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. And then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Well, last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir, come, let us kill him and take his inheritance. And so they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will be the end of those tenants? Well, he will bring those wretched to the wretched end, they replied. And he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. And Jesus said to them, have you never read the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to the pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. This is the reading of the gospel. Let us pray. Father God, we want to give you thanks and praise for this day, and we 
thank you for the word that has been uh, given in our hearing. And we ask you, O oh God, that you might call us uh, again to be caretakers and stewards of what it is that you have given us. Give us a zeal, give us a desire to do what you command. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake only. Amen. This morning we're talking about being a good steward. Being a good steward of the kingdom. You know, we have often said uh, from this place that parables of Jesus are a picture into what God in Christ does or wants believers to do or to experience. You know, the parables of Jesus are the autobiography of God. We have said this before. And you know that an autobiography is a personal account of one's life. If you write an autobiography, you are trying to give others some idea of who you are. I have said that the parables of Jesus are like that. They are a personal memoir of God's attitude. They are memoirs of God's action in history. And because these parables are heard during the time of the early church, these parables are also a window into the life of the church at that time. And so one of the questions we want to continually ask is, why did the writers of the New Testament preserve these particular accounts of the sayings of Jesus? It is because as they gave one another accounts of what Jesus said and did, there were some things that became so important. These things that they tell one another are there uh, in Scripture so that all things that God gives us God wants us to know them. We're talking about being a good steward of the kingdom. It is often that God gives us a picture of our relationship with the treasures that God gives us. There are several images that are introduced to us in the written word of God. For instance, the image of blessing. Many times when we receive something that makes us glad, we call it a blessing. For instance, when all of a sudden somebody comes to us and gives us some money that we were not expecting, we call that a blessing. We see it as something that ultimately comes from the one who the writer James says is the author of every good and perfect gift. In other words, it comes from God. And sometimes we show one another our thanksgiving for something that they have done or have meant to us, and we give them a blessing. You know, just recently, there was a sister of Christ that I know who sent me a check. I mean, it was, um, it was not expected. And not because I did anything in particular, but simply because she wanted to bless our home. There are other blessings that you and I have been given and do give. Perhaps we might give the blessing of our time, maybe some of our possessions, or maybe just a telephone call, or maybe just some kind of concern. Those are the blessings that we give one another. Maybe we might give somebody just two words like, thank you. Perhaps one of the things that we probably need to learn how to do is just to say thank you. That is a blessing. Not because we're trying to get anything back, but simply because it's just nice to do. It is the right thing to do. In other words, what we are saying is that one of the lenses through which we see some things coming to us is that of blessing. And for us, it's a miracle is a godsend. But there is, there is another image that we are given in Scripture as it relates to some of the things that we are given. And one of those images is that of being a steward. What is a steward? 
A steward is a person who is a caretaker, a caretaker of something that does not belong to them. Instead, it belongs to someone else. I remember leading a Bible study at some particular point, and, and at one particular moment, we talked about the fact that God gives us a picture in the book of Genesis of God creating all that there is, that God created the sun and the moon, that God created the fish of the seas, that God created the birds of the air, the vegetation and the animals that walk and creep on the ground. And when God comes to humanity, God says in chapter one, you are to till the earth, you are to subdue it. Now this does not mean make a mess of the, of the, of the earth and suppress it, but it means to develop it and take care of it. And what was revealed in that particular study was that human beings had been given the responsibility as humans to care for the creation. We are to manage it in such a way that it thrives. We are to take uh, uh, care that and make sure that life is permitted to multiply. So in other words, human beings are called to be stewards of the earth, caretakers of the earth. And I think that this past week, we heard two candidates uh, for president address the issue of the relationship between human beings and the creation. Many call it climate change. There's a little doubt that we are in an environmental crisis. That's part of the problem of what is happening with global warming. We are, have not done such a good job of taking care of the creation. Just think about our emissions and our fossil fuels, our daily pollution of the earth. It shows that we have not been good stewards or good caretakers as we ought. We have raped the land, we have polluted the atmosphere, we have not lived in harmony with what God has placed in our care. And yet, we are still permitted by this God to have another chance to be a part of the care of this earth on this side of the coming again of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, we are stewards. We are caretakers of many things. We are stewards of the talents that the Lord has given us individually. We are stewards of the time that we are given. We are stewards of the children with which God has gifted us. We are stewards of the earth. As we have reflected on our children, for instance, or our grandchildren, we have come to understand that the children that we have in our care are not ours. They are not our personal possession or servants. They are on loan to us just for a little while. And it is our responsibility to do our best so that they are nurtured and loved, so that they become the best that God desires for them to be. We are to make sure that what is made available to them is the word of God. We are to teach them something about the gospel, and how God comes to them in Jesus Christ. We are stewards of those children. And we are stewards of every time and every dime that God permits us to have. The money, for instance, though it may be little, little is not ours. Even in an economy such as we have today, whatever we have is not ours. It belongs to God. And you and I are stewards or caretakers or managers of these financial gifts. We are given the privilege to stand in for God while God is empowering us to live. So after we get through thanking God for all that we are and all that we have and all that we experience, all the gifts that God gives us, 
We are called to use it for God's glory and not for ours. Well, what about the text? The text from Matthew chapter 21. You know, sometimes you know when people are talking about you. You know when you begin to squirm and you know that somebody is actually has a me in their minds because of what they are saying. They are trying to get a point across. These religious leaders of Jesus' day knew exactly where Jesus was coming from. And that is why they eventually wanted to kill him. And so Jesus tells the parable of the landowner. He says, a landowner spent the time and finance to plant a vineyard. And according to the story, he not only planted it, he protected it by putting a wall around it. In other words, he made sure that there were protections. He made sure that there were boundaries. He put a wine press in it so that the grapes that were found in it would be able to produce great wine. It was a self-contained factory. In other words, he would be expecting some fruit when it came time for the harvest. And he built a tower. And this tower was designed to be a place where someone would look out for the enemies that might come to steal. The Bible says that he rented this land to some tenant farmers and went away on a journey. In other words, these tenants were what we would call sharecroppers. When the harvest time came, he sent his servants to collect the fruit. There was an agreement that these tenants would take care of what belonged to the landowner. The tenants seized the servants, beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. The landowner tried to give them another chance. He sent more servants this time. And the result was the same. And finally, this landowner sent his only son and they threw the son out of the vineyard and killed him. And the question was, what will the landowner do with these tenants? Well, he will bring these wretches to a wretched end and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give them his due. There is little doubt about what Jesus was getting at here. The religious leaders of Jesus' day were like those who were to be stewards of the kingdom of Israel. They were to be keepers of the mysteries of the kingdom, but they used it to their own purposes. They got caught up thinking that this vineyard belonged to them. When prophets like John the Baptist came, they killed him instead of heeding his voice. It was their end to be removed from being stewards of the kingdom and it would be given to others who would love it and who would honor it. So what is God saying to us, my friends? You know, Martin Luther once said that the greatest treasure of the church is the gospel. It is not its silver or gold. I was having a conversation with a particular woman one week and as I was witnessing at that particular point to Jesus Christ, she was casting the regular complaint about how religious people seem to be more interested in money rather than anything else. She issued that, that the complaint that religious people were sometimes more interested in looking down at their noses at others rather than being a community of acceptance and grace. Well, perhaps to some degree, she was right. The first thing that we need to say is that God is not calling us to be religious. God is calling us to be in relationship with his son. I'm talking about a daily walk that really is concerned about others. We miss out on that close communion with the Father. We miss out on that relationship in the communion or the community of the saints. 
We miss out on being fed with the word of God and living in the word. We miss out on being filled with the spirit and being empowered to live in a new realm. And what happens is, is that we are not interested in opening ourselves up to others who perhaps are different than we. And perhaps we sometimes do not focus on the sharing of the good news of Christ. Perhaps we are like the hearers of Jesus' parable who did not realize the great treasure that had been given them. My friends, when Jesus went to the cross to pay the penalty for our sins, he was making it possible to open the doors of the church for all. It did not matter what one had done. It did not matter what one or where one had gone. It did not matter about the past and how we might have wrecked our lives. The door was opened. God was not interested in what our station was in life. But what God was interested in was to become exactly what he wanted us to be. We were to come exactly as we were. That is the kind of kingdom that God has established. And we have been placed as stewards of that kingdom. And what we are going to do is to live that out. There's a writer of that famous hymn which says, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. In other words, come exactly as you are. And when that happens and you have relied on the grace of God, you become a steward of the kingdom. We become emissaries and messengers of the greatest story that has ever been told. We become disciples of the one who gave himself as the word, and he himself was a steward of what the Father gave him. Do you want to be a steward today? Do you want to represent, do you want to caretake, not on behalf of yourself, but on behalf of God. This has now been offered to you. Please take it. Amen. With the confidence of God's grace and mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Holy God, you call us to work for peace and justice in your vineyard. Refresh the church with your life that we may bear fruit through work and service. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. Thank you for the abundant harvest of, of the earth Bless the care of those whose hands bring the fruits of the earth to the tables of all who hunger. May we be inspired by your servants or who care deeply for your creation, especially Francis of Assisi, whom we commemorate today. Lord, in your mercy, hear Amen. our prayer. Curb the impulses of greed and pride that lead us to take advantage of others. Grant that world leaders seek the fruits of the kingdom of the good and welfare of all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sustain all who suffer with the promise of new life, assured of your presence, heal our pain and suffering, and equip us to embrace all bodies aching for wholeness of mind, body, and soul. We call to mind those who are struggling today, especially those we now need in this moment of silence.
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all managers in our community and for all who seek employment. Give hope and a future to those who like meaningful work, those who have, who have been marginalized or abused in the workplace, and those who desire new opportunities. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you for the saints who teach us to live faithfully in your vineyard. May our chorus join theirs until our labor is complete. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Listen as we call on you, O God, and enfold in your loving arms all for whom we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, let the church say amen. Amen. Now, as you came into the parking lot, you have been given an opportunity to give an offering to the Lord through the church. So let us pray. God of mercy and grace, the eyes of all wait upon you, and you open your hand in blessing. Fill us with good things at your table, that we may come to the help of all in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and Lord. Amen. Amen. And now, if you are prepared, please um, let us prepare for our communion with our Lord. Take your bread and take your fruit of the vine and prepare it for reception. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then in the same way, he took the cup. When he had given thanks and blessed it, he gave it to them, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. As often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. And now together, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please repeat after me. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us peace. Grant us peace. And now would you please take the bread or the wafer? And let us eat together. And let us take the wine and let us drink together. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, which you have received, strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Let, let us pray. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, 
strengthen us through this gift in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Just a couple of announcements. Um, uh, this week, we uh, continue our regular schedule here at uh, Lamb of God, rather, <laughs> uh, Salem, uh, Shalom. And uh, we are going to have a Bible study on Saturday uh, morning at 10 uh, a.m. We have a um, Zoom Bible study. And so if you are desirous to be a part of that study, uh, please uh, contact us and tell us that you'd like to be on that list. And if you send us your email address, we'll send you an invitation and link to be a part of that study. And we will continue to worship here at um, uh, Salem uh, Shalom at uh, 10.30 on Sunday uh, mornings. And we invite you to continue to tune in to be a part of this worship. Those of you who are on our leadership, you know that uh, next week we're going to be meeting um, at our Zoom, regular Zoom time, you'll be notified of that moment in time. We'll now receive uh, the benediction. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord, and honk your horns. Thanks be to God.